only Who's moving the chess player? What interests and motivate the actors behind each event? The board is deployed there. Critical move. Investigates every event from Monday to Friday. Only to the school. The Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. It access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. Mondays. Only on Telesur. In a world infested by inequalities, abuse of power and injustice, the American journalist Bobby Martin covers the struggle for fundamental rights world. Para mantenerme saludable, yo corro. To keep myself healthy, I study. Ya la dieta y soy yis, trefo me asusta. Para mantenerme saludable, yo bailo. Para mantenerme saludable, yo purifico mi espíritu a través del cuerpo. ¿Y tú? Get your body. Tuesdays, only on Telesur. Acompañamos a los pueblos que resisten en cada una de sus luchas. Somos esa ventana que se abre para visibilizarlos entre fronteras. Thursdays, only on LS1. Hola, ¿qué tal? Sean todos muy bienvenidos a Vida. Hay lugares donde el arte se unifica con el orgullo de los pueblos. Y esos lugares están llenos de colores, alegría, pasión, tradiciones, arraigo, valor y entrega. Real Life Fridays Only on the Resort A review of the world news that investigates, insights, analysis and induces criticism because every event has a context. Pusimos el punto en ahí. Dot in the eye. Saturdays. Only on Telesur. Una travesía para descubrirnos. Buscamos conexiones perdidas. No nos queda otra que luchar porque no tenemos nada que perder. Realmente es por todos. Recorremos el mundo con Reportajes Telesur. The life is full of moments. Moments of fight. Moments of hope. Moments that present. Moments that you can live in. Telesur documentaries. Sundays. Only on Telesur.
Tolosur English presents a weekly program to discuss the political, economic and social issues affecting the Caribbean community. We'll challenge stereotypes and impact the diversity of the region through the analysis of unique cultures, religions and art. We Caribbean. Wednesdays. Only on Tolosur. You're watching Telesur English, I'm Katrina Goss and these are the headlines at this hour. The Argentinian Senate has unanimously approved two bills on the Malvinas Islands. One of the bills establishes the implementation of a new demarcation of the outer limit of the Argentinian continental shelf and the other establishes the creation of a national council for matters related to the territory. The bills will now go to the Chamber of Deputies for final approval. Officials pointed out that this legislation represents another step in the state policy that Argentina has been developing for more than two decades regarding the islands and the dispute over their sovereignty with the United Kingdom, which continues to conduct military exercises in the region. The United States has now reported more than 4.2 million COVID-19 cases. Over 35,000 new cases were reported this Friday alone. Meanwhile, the COVID-19 death toll stands at almost 148,000. The states of New York, Florida, Texas and California are the most affected and many states have been forced to reimpose restrictions as the epidemic shows no signs of slowing. China on Friday ordered the U.S. consulate in the southwestern city of Chengdu to close in response to the United Nations decision ordering the Chinese consulate in Houston to shut down. On the morning of July 24, China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs informed the U.S. Embassy in China of its decision to withdraw its consent for the operation of the consulate general in Chengdu and also made specific requirements on the ceasing of operations and events in the consulate general. The current situation in bilateral relations is not what China desires to see, and the U.S. is completely responsible for this. Once again, we urge the U.S. to immediately retract its wrong decisions and create necessary conditions for bringing relations between the two countries back on track. Some of the personnel in the U.S. Consulate General in Chengdu engaged in activities inconsistent with their capacities and interfered in China's internal affairs and harmed China's national security interests. China has repeatedly made representations to the former consulate and America is aware of this. India recorded a new daily record of coronavirus cases this Friday at over 49,000. The national tally now stands at over 1.3 million cases, while the death toll is over 31,000 after over 700 deaths were reported in the last few hours. According to the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, India has a high rate of recovery of patients at 63.45%, despite the high number of cases reported. Over 800,000 patients have recovered to date. India is the third most affected country by the pandemic in the world, behind the United States and Brazil. And those are the headlines at this hour. For these and more stories, go to our website at telesurenglish.net. Join us on The Global African while we explore the underreported yet incredibly significant popular revolution in the small African country of Burkina Faso. This is The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. Thanks for joining. It's been said by some that Sub-Saharan Africa never got its Arab Spring. Many African leaders take power, dress in a military uniform, and then cling to it for decades. With every passing year, Africa's aging leaders become less representative of its youthful population. The relatively peaceful toppling of an entrenched government at the hands of civilian demonstrators is something almost unheard of in modern day Africa. And for those reasons, the ousting of Burkina Faso's president, Blaise Compore, after 27 years in power, rocked the continent. What happened on October 31st is also important beyond Burkina Faso's borders because during his rule, Campore positioned himself 
as a key ally of Europe and the United States, most recently in the fight against Islamic militants in the Sahel. The U.S. has a military base in the country from which it flies surveillance drones, and France has special forces there as well. After Kampore fled the country, the military then appointed Lieutenant Colonel Zita as provisional head of state, prompting a new wave of demonstrations to demand the restoration of civilian rule. The acting military rulers were close to agreeing with politicians, civil society groups, and religious leaders on a plan to set up a civilian interim authority. Today, Burkina Faso is seeking to put in place a transitional government. Last week, the political parties in Burkina Faso agreed that the civilian-led transition should last a year, followed by democratic elections in November 2015. Regional leaders are mediating in the landlocked former French colony that borders Mali, Niger, Côte d'Ivoire, Togo, and Benin. The country is under pressure from the international community especially the African Union, to return to civilian rule or face sanctions and suspension from that continental body. Burkina Faso is Sub-Saharan Africa's second largest producer of cotton, the main crop in the agricultural dependent economy, and the fifth largest gold mine, yet it remains one of the world's poorest countries. Formerly called the Republic of Upper Volta, the country was renamed Burkina Faso in 1984 by then-President Thomas Sankara. In October 1987, Sankara, along with 12 other officials, were killed in a coup d'etat organized by his supposed friend and ally, Blaise Compadre. Sankara's former colleague and Burkina Faso's president until October 31st of this year. Following the coup against Sankara, Kampore immediately reversed the nationalizations overturn nearly all of Sankara's policies, return the country back into the fold of the International Monetary Fund, and ultimately spurn most of Sankara's legacy. Joining us for our discussion of the developments in Burkina Faso, an uprising that's literally involved millions, are two people who are very well suited to address the subject. We have Mr. Paul Sankara, the brother of the late revolutionary and president of Burkina Faso, Thomas San Sankara. Mr. Sankara studied at the University of Ouagadougou and currently lives in Washington, D.C. Also joining us is Dr. Naka Lagoke, a specialist in African political affairs, development, and pan-Africanism. He's a professor of Spanish at the University of the District of Columbia and professor of African history at Montgomery College. He founded the Revival of Pan-Africanism Forum, which engages in a permanent conversation on Africa from a pan-African perspective. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank it's you very pleasure. much for the opportunity. Let me start with you, Mr. Sankara. The, the uprising in, in Burkina Faso took a lot of people by surprise. But what I found particularly striking is that you're talking about millions of people, uh, uh, at least one demonstration where there's a million people, what provoked this? And a million people don't come out of nowhere. Somebody must have been organizing. Tell us about it. Thank you for having me. Um, I just want to start uh, first and foremost to uh, pay a tribute to more than 30 people uh, killed in this uh, revolution, second revolution in Burkina Faso. It's 27 years of uh, uh, the former regime of Bless Compare, I guess, has a deep impact in what has been grooming uh, in the grassroots level. I guess since 1987, the year of Thomas Sankara's assassination, uh, things are really starting to get organized with a lot of difficulties because the new regime with Bless Compare didn't give chance to anybody to have a normal organization, freedom of speech and freedom of organization. But mainly it's two uh, factors. Mm -hmm. The 27 years has some impact in a bad way, of course, in the sense that uh, you couldn't see this organization coming to express at a certain point the, the way they are uh, fed up. 
and uh, of course the willing of the compulsory regime to uh, revise through different sort of uh, maneuvering approaches the constitution in order to be a new candidate next year that's one thing the second one it's the youth that we can characterize mm -hmm. uh, roughly by the uh, ballet citoyen movement composed by uh, 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 compound by young artists that have been doing a great job uh, more than five years so they uh, were using they know uh, how through the, the, the song through the artist uh, works to talk to people to talk to the youth and indeed they succeed in this way and uh, it was not just the, the, the using the, the artistic uh, uh, talent mm -hmm. even they, they, they have a, a conscience a level of conscience they went to uh, different places like clinics hospitals to clean up and just give some uh, basics gift to uh, uh, women that gave birth uh, and women that uh, belong to a low level uh, income uh, families. Mm. So this kind of uh, action, uh, I think combine it with the, the willing of the composed regime to change the constitution even after 27 years, yeah, brought uh, you know, uh, this new revolution in Burkina Faso, roughly speaking. Dr. Lukoke, you texted me. You were the person that told me this uprising was happening and that Kampore was gone. The excitement that came through in that text was palatable. Why? Why were you so excited? What was it about this uprising? Uh, because I have waited for the I have waited for that moment for 27 years. Uh, I, Sankara was uh, uh, my hero. He was one of the people I have I have loved. Uh, you know, as uh, you know. We were told that nothing good can come from Africa. Mm -hmm. And then um, when we were in high school, we saw a young man uh, rising to power and doing exactly what we were dreaming to do or to see in our leadership. And then he was killed. And um, uh, we were hoping to see the people of Burkina Faso organizing, you know, to put an end to the blessed compare regime. That's why I have that uh, I, was, uh, I was excited. And uh, just to add something to... Uh, to what Paul said, the children who did the revolution, or the youth, people call them the children revolution. Mm -hmm. Many of them were uh, maybe member of the of the pioneer movement that Thomas Sankara put into place. Mm -hmm. Some never saw the revolution, but they went, they read, and they were lucky to have uh, the, the, the leaders of the civic broom movement that he was talking about, Le Ballet Citoyen, Correct. civic broom. Uh, they launched that organization last year. It, so that was like the triggering, a triggering factor of that energized movement in the, in, 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 that, that, that was going to put an end to, to, uh, to Bless Compare's regime. Many of our viewers probably know very little about the history of Burkina Faso may never have heard the name Thomas Sankara. And it would be useful to do a, a brief summary. And, and, and one particular thing that interests me is that when I've read the story of the revolution and the coup that overthrew Sankara and led to his murder, it sounds almost Shakespearean. I mean, here you have his right-hand person who was supposed to be his friend turn on him and, and then murder him or make sure that, uh, ensure that he was murdered. And so it would be useful to talk some about what happened. Where did this revolution come from in, in 1983? Correct. Yes. It's, uh, there was a link uh, between this question and the previous one. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we should start from what people used, to, how people used to see the former Upper Volta, mm. which became in 1984 Burkina Faso, which means upright land. Mm -hmm. A new name gave by Thomas as a leader 
of the revolution from 1983 to 1987 in Burkina Faso. Uh, most of African used to uh, see in the, the students in Europe organization, African organization in Europe, um, or the trade union in West Africa at least, mm -hmm. that book, the former upper Volta, now Burkina Faso, was among the top three or five conscience student or trade union uh, organization. Uh, and indeed, uh, a lot of things happened in Burkina Faso before the revolution of Sankara. And uh, Sankara, Thomas and uh, others, uh, militaries had, had a direct link with uh, the leftist political organization before uh, getting uh, to the power. Mm -hmm. He used to say Thomas Sankara by himself uh, is not, not getting the power for the power. Mm -hmm. We have to have a program, an agenda, in order to, to be ready to implement for the people uh, 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 satisfaction and benefits. So that's why the revolution was popular mm -hmm. in 1983, because of the link few couple of decades before be link between uh, the leftist organizational uh, civilian organization and the those uh, young military officers sankara is overthrown and murdered uh, i understand that there was some resistance to kampore but it doesn't sound like there was mass resistance to the new regime am i incorrect on that no correct that's correct uh, it took time to get to uh, this November revolution for a couple of reasons. The first one, uh, the new regime with Comparis didn't give any chance, and I'm talking about the brutal way of uh, stopping any uh, ambition or any uh, willing to organize uh, themselves. Mm -hmm. Whether it is at the student level, uh, the trade union, those who want to uh, resist to the new regime of Blaise Compaore, some of them has been assassinated, others uh, tortured, and uh, the third categories uh, fled the country and went to uh, different countries, whether in Europe or in West African country, in order to seek uh, asylum. Mm -hmm. And uh, he used also uh, the power of the, the money to, uh, to, to get through the clientelism, a uh, lot of people. So yeah, there were not, to be honest, uh, a mass movement against Blaise Compaore. First October revolution uh, of the 21st uh, century, uh, right? <laughs> the implication, impact for the rest of, uh, well, let's just start with West Africa. What, what do you anticipate them to be? Uh, as uh, you know, uh, you found the, uh, Asylum in Ivory Coast. That's right. And uh, 33 cars. Yeah, 33 cars, and you know, the French helped. It was trying to go to, to Po, according to what we read, and the population did not want him to be there. And that's uh, uh, Paul, Paul would have spoken better about that. The military base from which, uh, you know, he, he went uh, with uh, Thomas to take power in uh, 1983. Mm -hmm. So now he was going towards that place in the southern part of Burkina Faso, and now uh, he found himself in Ivory in Ivory Coast. Blaise Compaoré has supported the rebellion in Ivory Coast. He sheltered the rebels uh, close to Alassane Nord Ouattara, so mm -hmm. he supported the regime of Ouattara mm -hmm. after civil war in, that they caused in Ivory Coast. And Blaise Compaoré caused many wars in uh, in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, mm -hmm. in different parts you know, in in Africa. So. For him to find himself in Ivory Coast, it shows that it is that it's that the, the, the end of the of, of the of the circle, like in some uh, mystical people we say that the snake is biting its uh, tail. tail. Yeah, we believe that Pan Africanism is going to gain a, a momentum because the, the, the youth who organized, uh, they built the movement with the spirit and energy of Thomas Sankara. Mm -hmm. The singers we were talking about, Smokey. Uh, Sam Skaloja and, and many others. Uh, it is on YouTube. They produce songs 
uh, about Thomas Sankara for years. They've been doing that, and uh, and uh, Didi Awadi from Senegal, uh, also, and with uh, other artists that produce songs. And now we can see uh, the the resurrection of of the spirit of Thomas Sankara, and Thomas Sankara, he was the face and the spirit of the '83 revolution. But this time, his spirit is the inspirational uh, entity of that revolution. And we can see his spirit engulfing uh, on, 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 on Africa because in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Burundi, uh, in Togo, mm -hmm. in Benin, in all those parts, the people are saying, if the people of Burkina Faso, they did it, we too can do it. That's the that, that, that's a, that's a second... Uh, a uh, second impact of that Burkina Bay revolution on, on the rest of Africa. Now, I have as much excitement as you do about this, but I'm worried. The, the, the military in Burkina Faso is not, we're not talking about the, the left military of 1983. We're talking about a military that has been trained by the United States, where there's been a, a intense cooperation with the United States and France. Uh, why should I believe that the military will just simply walk away at this point? Oh, uh, uh, because it's not just the military; even the political elites over there, mm -hmm. uh, they have some uh, they have uh, some strong alliances with the West. The leader of the opposition, uh, Zéphirine Diabré, and uh, Christian Roque Cabore. Who, uh, create, who left Blessing Power. He was among uh, more than 100 people who left Blessing Power's party in the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. And now uh, they created the MPP movement for, for, for people's progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, the President Diabre's party, the Union for, for, for Progress and Change, UPC, those two individuals who are the most prominent figures of the opposition are not, uh, they're not left wingers. Those people, they're you know, they, you know, they have some, some alliances with the West. Mm -hmm. So we have to worry, and I respect that. We have to worry about the army and about that political elite. But the thing that is different in Burkina Faso is the power of the people. Like you said, one million people, that was in Ouagadougou. Mm -hmm. They did not talk about many other hundreds of thousands of people in Bobo Dulasso, in Kudugu, in, are you, in all those, all those places. I didn't even hear about that. Yes, yeah. they were protesting in, right. all those, in all these places. It was not just Ouagadougou. Okay. So the people are there, and they are, they are conscious of their power. That's the beauty of the Burkina Bay Revolution. They, they're human beings. They may fail. They may falter. But at least the same way the spirit of Thomas Sankara uh, could, was not destroyed with, as, with as, his assassination, even if that new wave of the Burkina Bay revolution like, well, has to fail, we will still see that spirit, that revolution spirit uh, that, that is going to inspire you know, the organization and the building of the institution in Burkina Faso. That's why, and despite you know, the challenges you just mentioned, I'm still I'm, I'm hopeful. And the people seem to know what they're doing. And uh, the chart of the transition mm -hmm. uh, has been adopted. It's going to be adopted tomorrow. All the political parties, the army, everyone, you know, they agree on the chart of the transition. And they agreed that the transition has to be led by a civilian. The army has to concede that because of the pressure internal and external. Are there institutions that have been created in the midst of this revolution to push things forward? Are there new parties or associations or other things that have emerged to, to advance the revolution? No, not quite. No, I don't. I don't think so. It maybe a couple of uh, parties, mm -hmm. uh, political parties, and uh, civilian societies organization since Blas Compore uh, clearly, without saying that he will be a uh, candidate next year, 2015, after 27 years on the power. Since that time, yes, uh, people found the, uh, the necessity to to organize themselves. That's mm -hmm. why. Uh, Yanka was telling about the, those who resigned from his um, political party, from Blaise Compaore mm -hmm. political party, mm -hmm. and not just, when I say simple quote-unquote members, that's key members of his party. That's mm. uh, about a year ago. 
Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Like it's at the beginning of this year. This year. And then uh, the, the minimum of the one, some of the people, prime minister, mm -hmm. a former prime minister, former pres a pre president of the parliament, and the leader of the party. Correct. So the regime was disintegrated. Co yeah, it is. Correct, exactly. Yeah. So, so, we can. So, yeah. 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 so we saw it. What we see, we've been following that. We saw it coming. And now, uh, uh, when the time was right, and instead of going through the referendums, and he wanted to go through the parliament, and then after enticing and seducing a parliamentary group of the opposition that switched its allegiance to Blaise Compaoré, to in order for him to secure the three-fourths of the votes, to, you know, to, to vote the law, and the people say, you know what, uh, that's the moment, and enough is enough. And then uh, they, they've been organizing since, uh, uh, since, uh, for, since the beginning of the year. Even last year, they've been doing that. Meetings, uh, going from rural areas everywhere, you know, to mobilize people that, you know, the, the turning point is coming, and people have to be ready. Let me ask you one other question. The African Union. Uh, the African Union indicated that they wanted the military to move on. Are they playing any more active role? Is, was that just simply a pronouncement, or are they in any way helping in the process? Well, the, the, the African Union uh, has, well, uh, United Nations, mm -hmm. United States of America, and... Uh, uh, Europe Union said clearly in the, the beginning that they, uh, the military should, uh, you know, give uh, leave the power. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, uh, quickly as possible, like two weeks. At the same time, uh, as has been said by a lot of people, they should do it long time ago with the tools and the power that is have, and this kind of power like. Bless Compos regime. Mm -hmm. uh, let him know that just through the speech and declaration, but use the through envoys uh, and uh, uh, they know how to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, not not bombing a, a country or using military uh, forces, but all the in the national institutions, African uh, Union and uh, industrialized countries could since like next year, uh, last year, uh, put a real concrete pressure in Blaise Compaoré, on Blaise Compaoré in order to avoid what's happened. But mm -hmm. anyway, uh, we know that uh, they, uh, as somebody said, uh, in terms of uh, relationship, states, and uh, between states and states, there is no friendship. It's just That's a right. question of a uh, matter of interest. That's right. Gentlemen, your enthusiasm and excitement is infectious. Um, it's a real pleasure having this discussion with you about such uh, an incredible development on the continent. Thank you very much for spending the time with us. Thank you, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this episode of The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Coincidiendo con el natalicio de Bolívar y motorizada fundamentalmente por Hugo Chávez, nace Telesur, apoyada por otros líderes latinoamericanos y prestigiosos intelectuales. Felicito a sus trabajadoras y trabajadores. Sigo viendo Telesur, soy Irma Parentela, coalición por una comunicación democrática de Argentina. Para mantenerme saludable, yo corro. To keep myself healthy, I study. Y a nadie te hizo yis, trajo me asustar. Para mantenerme saludable, yo bailo. Para mantenerme saludable, yo purifico mi espíritu a través del cuerpo. ¿Y tú? Guide your body. Tuesdays, only on Telesur. Our duty is to keep you informed with the latest news every day on events in Latin America, the Caribbean, and the rest of the world. Today, the world faces a common enemy, a virus that is spreading rapidly. Known as COVID-19, it cares not for our age. We are all at risk of being infected, which is why the best thing that you can do to stop it is stay at home. By going out, you are at risk and put your loved ones at risk. Right now, the most important thing is to protect yourself. And protect those around you. 
we all have a responsibility to do what we can to keep ourselves and others safe. Together, we can stop the spread of the virus. For your family, for your parents, for your grandparents. To stop COVID-19. Stay home. We will keep you informed. Telesur celebrates its 15th anniversary this Friday as a Latin American and Caribbean multimedia platform that continues to strengthen its counter-hegemonic project. In the United States, Democratic candidate Joe Biden is leading Donald Trump in the presidential race in Florida. Hundreds of Israelis held another protest against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu outside his residence in Jerusalem on Friday. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south, I'm Katrina Goss. This Friday, Cuban President Miguel Diaz-Canel sent a congratulatory message to our multinational channel Telesur on the occasion of its 15th anniversary. In the message shared on Twitter, the Cuban president highlighted the legacies of Simón Bolívar, José Martí, Fidel Castro and Hugo Chávez as the inspiration for the multimedia platform. Patricia, queridos fundadores, periodistas y técnicos, Telesur is that dream of freedom in the hands of Venezuelans, Argentinians, Uruguayans, Colombians, Brazilians, Cubans, and an infinite number of intellectuals from our America. Telesur was founded and made possible by the intelligence, the will, and the dreams of two of its most distinguished and brave children, Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez. From Havana, where the new Telesur studios are growing, where the idea of its creation was born, to the already historic sites of Caracas, where it was launched into the world as a small television station that later became the giant nightmare of the empire's liars and its regional lackeys, comes the encouragement and commitment of those who no longer know, nor can, nor will accept to live without Telesur. We hug you in the distance, as we witness with happiness and enthusiasm the powerful flight of Telesur, 15 years after its creation, cleansing the murky waters of the contemporary digital world to all continents, in Spanish and in English, in America, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia and in the Middle East. You can always count on Cuba, which feels like the seed, branch and flower of this dream of integration that together we made possible. Congratulations, Telesur. In other news, tropical storm Gonzalo has triggered hurricane warnings as it moved towards the Lesser Antilles. According to the National Hurricane Center based in the U.S. state of Florida, a tropical storm warning is now in effect for Barbados, as well as for St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which means that tropical storm conditions are expected somewhere within the next 36 hours. A hurricane watch was previously in effect for Barbados and remains in effect for Trinidad and Tobago and Grenada. In Trinidad and Tobago, Minister of Communications Donna Cox has pleaded with the population to be responsible and follow public health guidelines on COVID-19 following the confirmation of new cases over the past few days. Speaking during a virtual press conference, the minister also highlighted the situation in the Bahamas following a surge in COVID-19 cases there. The Ministry of Health in the Bahamas confirmed that they saw 20 additional confirmed cases of COVID-19 in that country which led the Prime Minister to table a resolution in Parliament seeking to extend the COVID-19 state of emergency and emergency orders until September 30th. Additionally, 
Grand Bahama will be placed on a two-week lockdown which takes effect today to curb the surge of cases on the island. And this extension comes as the country experiences a surge in coronavirus cases with Grand Bahama emerging as a hotspot. Here at home, the recent cases of COVID-19 over the past few days is a reminder to all of us that we can find ourselves in the same position as a country if we do not follow our public health guidelines. We cannot become complacent and we must do what is necessary to protect ourselves and our families. The Parliament of Antigua and Barbuda will be asked to extend the state of emergency by another three months. The measure provides the government with extraordinary powers to take action in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Parliamentarians will next week debate extending the measure until October 31st. It gives the government uh, the coverage under that particular provision to be able to uh, have the flexibility of imposing um, the different curfew uh, restrictions. Um, this does not indicate that we perceive that there is any worsening of the situation, but the government must have uh, that particular option. Uh, both the curfew and the regulations would come to an end at the 31st of uh, July. We cannot put the curfew in place, an extended curfew in place, without the emergency powers. So once the parliament approves that on Tuesday, um, more than likely at the following cabinet meeting, we will um, extend the curfew period as well. I can't see that there's any issue on the ground right now that is before us that will cause us to alter that beyond 11 to 5 where they are. But again, that's a decision that the cabinet will make next week. There's going to be no issuance of any new work permits during the 90-day period for any reason whatsoever. Uh, but that persons who would have already been in the system and have been employed um, and would require a renewal of the work permit, those will be uh, permitted. The Argentinian Senate has unanimously approved two bills on the Malvinas Islands. One of the bills establishes the implementation of a new demarcation of the outer limit of the Argentinian continental shelf and the other establishes the creation of a national council for matters related to the territory. The bills will now go to the Chamber of Deputies for final approval. Officials pointed out that this legislation represents another step in the state policy that Argentina has been developing for more than two decades regarding the islands and the dispute over their sovereignty with the United Kingdom, which continues to conduct military exercises in the region. In Mexico, Senator Martha Lucia Mitcher announced that the nation will apply the Spotlight Initiative in the fight against gender violence with the support of the United Nations. The senator announced that legislation in the field will be reformed. Meanwhile, the representative of UN Women in Mexico, Belén Sanz Luque, explained that the Spotlight Initiative is a worldwide alliance focused on the prevention and elimination of all forms of violence against women and girls. Luque noted that Mexico was chosen for its implementation due to the high rates of femicide in the country and stressed that it will serve as a model for other countries in the region. In Mexico, work is progressing on the Felipe Angeles International Airport, one of the most important infrastructure works of the government of President Andrés Manuel López Obrador and considered one of the key elements in confronting the economic crisis sparked by the coronavirus pandemic. Our correspondent in Mexico City, Eduardo Martinez, brings us more details. Across 1,531 hectares of land, an air terminal is being built which, according to the Mexican government, will be the most modern in Latin America. The project contemplates the construction of facilities for both military and commercial use. In total, the airport will have two commercial runways and a third one that will be exclusively for military operations. Felipe Ángeles International Airport will have the capacity to welcome 20 million passengers each year and will complement the operations of the current terminal located 45 kilometers away. The works undertaken by personnel of the Secretariat of National Defense continue despite the health emergency sparked by the coronavirus and under a strict preventive measures. The use of face masks, distancing and even dividing personnel over different shifts. Shifts had been implemented in an administrative area and staff had been sent to work from home to avoid crowding. With more than 600 days of construction remaining, the progress is significant. Since the beginning of the work in October 2019, and to date, 32,000 civilian jobs have been generated. There is no intermediary. Everything is directly between the Secretariat of National Defense and the final worker, or the final suppliers who bring service and materials.
El presidente Andrés Manuel López Obrador committed to inaugurating the airport complex on March 21st, 2022. In addition, he assured that the cost will be much lower than what had been forecast by the airport that the former administration began building on land surrounding Lake Texcoco. This is an example of how a budget can suffice. If you handle it honestly and you can do more with less, it is a symbol regardless of other factors. Just the cost of the work shows we are moving forward. The budget for this airport One of the emblematic works of the López Obrador administration is around $3 billion, far below the $11 billion that his predecessor planned to spend on a different airport that would not have been ready until 2026. Eduardo Martínez, Telesur, Zumpanco, State of Mexico. And we'll be right back after this short break, so don't go away. Mi nombre es Florencia Guimarães García, soy activista travesti, vivo en Argentina y quiero en esta ocasión saludar por los 15 años de Telesur, por estos 15 años informándonos, informando al mundo sobre lo que el imperialismo quiere ocultar. 15 años revolucionando los medios hegemónicos de comunicación. Saludar y agradecer por replicar siempre las voces del colectivo LGTBIQ+. Un abrazo enorme, fuerte y revolucionario. Furia travesti y hasta la victoria siempre. back to From the South. In the United States, Democratic candidate Joe Biden is leading Donald Trump in the presidential race in Florida. According to a poll conducted by Kinney Piak University, Biden leads by 13 points in the highly important state. 51% of people who took part in the survey said they would vote for the Democratic candidate in the upcoming presidential elections on November 3rd, while 38% said they would vote for the current U.S. president. The same poll conducted in April gave Biden just a four-point lead. Doesn't want to be distracted by. The United States has now reported more than 4.2 million COVID-19 cases. Over 35,000 new cases were reported this Friday alone. Meanwhile, the COVID-19 death toll stands at almost 148,000. The states of New York, Florida, Texas and California are the most affected, and many states have been forced to reimpose restrictions as the epidemic shows no signs of slowing. China on Friday ordered the U.S. consulate in the southwestern city of Chengdu to close in response to the United States decision ordering the Chinese consulate in Houston to shut down. On the morning of July 24th, China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs informed the U.S. Embassy in China of its decision to withdraw its consent for the operation of the consulate general in Chengdu and also made specific requirements on the ceasing of operations and events in the consulate general. The current situation in bilateral relations is not what China desires to see, and the U.S. is completely responsible for this. Once again, we urge the U.S. to immediately retract its wrong decisions and create necessary conditions for bringing relations between the two countries back on track. Some of the personnel in the U.S. Consulate General in Chengdu engaged in activities inconsistent with their capacities and interfered in China's internal affairs and harmed China's national security interests. China has repeatedly made representations to the former consulate and America is aware of this. Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Sakharova stressed on Friday that Moscow and Beijing have become the main targets of an information war led by Western media. Sakharova made the statements during a video conference with her Chinese counterpart, Hua Changyin.
The comments come after Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said Russia would not be interested in joining a United States alliance against China following U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's call for a broad alliance against Beijing on Thursday. Peskov said that Russia does not participate in any alliances against anyone and that China was Russia's ally and partner. It is not just aggressive rhetoric that is backed up by no less aggressive actions, but now it's an attempt to provoke a public clash between Russia and China. And I can assure you that they will not succeed in this, but the fact that we've registered this, that this provocation from our Western partners, foremost the United States, take place is a very serious sign. Russian authorities this Friday announced their assumption of international flights starting on August 1st. A decision has been taken to resume international air travel. We have taken into account the epidemiological situation, infection studies and the principle of reciprocity. Starting on August 1st, flights will take place from Moscow, Moscow region, St. Petersburg and rostov on Don. This decision will also help us speed up the process of returning our citizens home from abroad. A three-year-old girl has become Belgium's youngest known victim of the coronavirus as the country confronts a worrying surge in new cases. A health spokesman noted that three people die each day from COVID-19 in Belgium, including recently the toddler and an 18-year-old boy. The official warned against complacency among the healthy, highlighting that no one is immune to the virus. Belgium has now reported nearly 65,000 COVID-19 cases. Prime Minister Sophie Wilms announced tougher rules on wearing masks in public places and postponed plans to further ease lockdown measures next month. A few days ago, a three-year-old child died from a COVID-19 infection. This news touches all of us deeply, both as scientists and as parents. I would like to take this opportunity to express my most sincere condolences to the family. This Friday, the Croatian parliament approved a new government led by the Croatian Democratic Union Party, which won the elections held earlier this month. Prime Minister Andrei Plenković will lead the new government, which was supported by 76 votes to 59 in the 151-member assembly. The Croatian Democratic Union Party won 66 seats in the elections held on July 5th, while the Restart Coalition, led by the Social Democratic Party, secured 41. The Prime Minister noted that the new government's main goal would be to boost the economy heavily impacted by the novel coronavirus pandemic. Our wish is that in four years Croatia looks better than it looks today, as today it looks better than it looked in 2016. That is the fundamental motive that we have and for which we will work and that is welfare of all Croatian citizens and all Croatians that live abroad. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Hola, soy Estela Carlotto, presidenta de Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo y en nombre de la institución que presido y todos los que colaboran con nosotros quiero manifestar primero que Telesur 